Good day, good day everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Blaze Connected Construction Series. So today we'll be talking about business and architectural practices in Nigeria. And this is informed by the fact that oftentimes as professionals in the built sector, we tend to spend the better part of our career acquiring very technical skills. And then we also neglect some other skills that we need to develop, which is needed to build very big businesses as we've seen in other industries. So today I have in the house architect Oludolapo Ojelabi, who is a Lagos-based architect and IT expert specializing in using technology to provide business solutions to African AEC businesses. So after working in the real estate, architectural design and construction and tech industries, he soon realized that AEC businesses could use purpose-built technology solutions to solve the business productivity and profitability challenges that is unique to Africa. So today has deployed solutions in both the private and government organizations across Africa. But why is not at work, you know, implementing all these solutions? So the boy enjoys motorcycling, travel, outdoor, camping, reading and visiting museums and art galleries. So it's great to have Udulabo in the house today. How are you doing, sir? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're most welcome. So today, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be talking about business and architectural practices in Nigeria. And just as other sessions, I'll be asking you quite a number of questions around this topic. And of course, if you have any questions during the discussion, feel free to type them into the comment section and we'll be address them after the discussion. So I'll go straight to it. The first question I have is that, I mean, you've worked in both the built and the IT sectors. I mean, specifically, you worked in IDIT for some years, IDIT technology for some years, and before that, you also worked at Vertical Images for some years. So IDIT in the IT sector and Vertical Images in the built sector. So what is the experience like working in both sectors? And what lessons do you think the built sector can extract from the IT sector in creating very scalable businesses? I mean, by scalable businesses, I'm talking about businesses that can outlive the founder and also spread across different parts of the world. Why not be, you know, collapsing under his own weight. What lessons do you think you can learn from the IT sector to create this? Okay, thank you. If we look at the two um, different, if the two sectors, they are different in some particular ways. So if you look in terms of um, the effort you apply, it's different. Actually, there are so many different ecosystems, things places you could occupy in the different spaces. But in terms of lessons learned, I would just give one or two that come to mind that I think will be applicable directly to the built industry. So as far as scalability is concerned, you want a business that as you add more um, customers, the capacity of your system doesn't get overstretched or collapsed. Uh, the equivalent would be for an architectural firm that can handle, say, a thousand clients in a year. I know that would be a stretch for the majority of architectural firms, but you help tech firms can sell a million licenses and doesn't change anything apart from maybe having to add on more technical support. So, the IT sector has built a product. They've created products, whether it, even when it's hardware, it's still a product. And when it's software, it's, pro, it's a general product that many people can use. And they spend a lot of time ensuring they find that product market fit so that there's a large enough market that wants their product. So for the built sector, we would have to find a way to create a product that many people can gain access to. I've heard of companies that take the brief taking process and create a product out of it. Uh, there, are, there are people that sell house types, um, existing prototypes of buildings. You know, even looking at development itself, it's a kind of approach to creating products from the practice of architecture and the 
um, construction space. You also find out that um, the tech sector, they end up investing a large amount of time and money into improving their product. Almost every year, they are coming up with updates. They are improving the capacity of their product. You find out they spend a lot of money on branding, maintaining a sales force, um, the, the sales force outweighs the technical development team. Uh, in architecture, you focus on the technical, <coughs> excuse me, and the ability of most firms to market, to, to get clients, it's, it's still based in the practices of 30 years, 40 years ago. Uh, so that's also something you can look into then you find out that in terms of employing staff, employing the techni technical guys that build the products, the tech companies go for the very best. They will not compromise. It's the best. Look at Google, um, uh, Apple, all the tech companies employ the very best. It becomes a kind of prestigious thing for you to work in some of these tech companies. Uh, if you look at Nigeria, a lot of companies just take core members that don't have a lot of experience, and that's all they have. Or some just say, okay, uh, I know it's based on the economy, it's based on the environment, but still, if you're going to compare apples to apples, then it means that we would have to make sure that the quality of the staff, the people that run the organization, is, is very best. Um, the, the people in the organization, determine what the company will become because it's their knowledge that determines the output. So this is also one area. Then um, it, this is actually crucial because, you know, in the software industry, if if a particular software crashes, you just restart and, you know, the company gets aware of the bugs and they send updates. In the build sector, if the company, if the building crashes, that's a collapse. You can't restart that building. You can't send a software update. You know, it's a real problem. So the the requirement for having top-notch talent in the built state, uh, built environment is even higher than what you would you should um, expect from the tech industry. Uh, so I'll say, let me just stop there. These are some of the things, areas in which I think um, we can learn from the tech industry. Yeah, that's a whole lot of lessons. At least I can pick quite some important points, which is being able to productivize or productize, if I'm going to use that word, you know, the the products that we, that we put out, which is buildings and other built assets. And also being able to do a whole lot of market research and, you know, committing a lot of resources to understand the market and also the users, and also paying a, a great deal of attention on the the skill set, the people, the workforce, the people that are going to actually deliver all these buildings, all these built assets. So those are some interesting lessons I can pick out from that response, which is quite great. Okay, so the next question I have is that, you know, when you look at the architectural practices in Nigeria, you find out that a lot of them are solo practices in the sense that they are being managed by the founders of those companies and they are usually just one or two people in the practice. So what strategies do you think we can deploy as architects? to create intergenerational businesses, businesses that can outlive the founders and, you know, go several generations after. Thank you for that question. So I'll start by saying again, the situation we find ourselves in has a lot of factors that cause it, but we're not going to that. If you look at the number of solo practices that we have, you want to ask this, the question, how did we get there? Um, we can't ignore the fact that architects generally don't get well paid across the world. It's not just Nigeria. And when an architect says that the boss really isn't all that great himself, most of the time, he says, I can do this myself, goes out there, and for a lot of them, it's basically a means of survival. So the very first step, as far as from a business standpoint, is that building a business that spans multiple generations requires 
wanting to build something like that. It doesn't happen by accident. It's not something that just happens. It's something you plan for. Uh, in business called succession planning. And it's not one year, it's not two years. A, a lot of times, it's something that takes a long while. You can look at examples in Nigeria. GT Bank is one that comes to mind. Being a relatively young bank that has gone through at least two major changes that I can recall. Okay, so once you decide to go intergenerational, you want to last for 50 years, 60, 70, 150 years, or maybe even 200 years, it affects every decision that you make. It affects the quality of staff that you employ. It affects the structure, business structure that you put in place. It means that you're going to take issues like taxation and all these other things extremely seriously. You're going to make sure that your books are in order. You're going to ensure that your branding, in fact, the, the space that you occupy in the space, in the um, built environment, you're going to be very particular about it. Um, if you look at solo firms, I, I would say the, the easiest step I can see is for people to come together to form companies. Right now, in the startup space, if you're looking for funding and you're a solo uh, founder, it's very difficult to get funding. They're going to tell you, come back when you have a co-founder. In fact, if you know Dropbox, the first time he tried to get funding from uh, Y Combinator, he, he couldn't get until he went to get a co-founder. And that's because they are blind spots. Nobody knows it all. So getting a co-founder, or maybe it could be three people or four people that come together. One is very good in design. One is good with um, connecting with people, getting business. You know, one is good with office management. It gives the organization a better foundation to stand on. You know, we say, oh, I don't trust this person. I don't trust that person. Form partnerships with people from your university, people you've known from back in the days, or maybe someone you met at an old uh, workplace. You know, these kind of people, you've seen how they work, you've seen their work ethics, you've seen the, the way they react to pressure. All these things would help. Um, let's assume that we have an, an organization that is already doing well and they want to transfer the ownership management to the next generation. And generation now, let's, let's assume we're looking at people that are, say, 70 years old, wanted to transfer to someone that's like 30, 40, or maybe 20 something years. Um, the usual process is you have the founder operating for a while, then he, ident he identifies the kind of person that can take the company to the next level, works together hand in hand with this person or with the team of people that he wants to hand over to, and then allows the person to run with some minimal guidance before the founders now retreat and allow them go. That's one way. If you want this to, st to stay within the business, if you want to create um, a, um, a plan that ensures that the company expands in another direction, you can easily just look at a group of people. It could be existing staff and say, okay, you guys, you guys are good. We've trained you very well. Why don't you start a new company? Three, four of you will provide the um, the angel funds. Uh, we'll give you the money. We'll give you the support. Start and you know fill in that space. An example would be some of the churches around. I know City of David had something like that where they had a small church for the youth, um, pastors, everything complete. You know, affiliated to the church but different. Um, so it, it's either you go. This company name is what I want to continue for the next 150 years, or we want to have uh, subsidiaries that are specialized in maybe apartment buildings, this one maybe beach houses, this one maybe schools, things like that, and then make sure you empower the younger generation to continue. So I'll just stop there. Okay, yeah, so I think it's all about mindset. I mean, right from the onset, the vision you have when you're setting up a company, are you setting up a company that it's just a means to survive or are you creating an entity that is expected to last for 
200 years down the line and all that. So that's basically, that mindset basically affects every other decision you're making and every other step you're taking, which is obviously very true. So I'll just go to the next question. So basically, the training they are giving to affectionate students in tertiary institutions seem insufficient to prep them to build sustainable businesses and careers. I mean, when you compare the practice outside of school and the training that students receive in school, you find out that it's quite insufficient. So how do you think that this gap can be filled both by the higher education institutions and also by the architecture students themselves? Thank you for the question. I'm very careful on this one. <laughs> very <laughs> careful. <laughs> um, I don't think, as far as Nigeria is concerned right now, that there's much we can do with the tertiary education. I don't think there's much we can do, and there are many reasons for that. But like I said, I'll be very careful with this one. Globally, the university system is failing. It's not evolving rapidly enough to keep pace with development in the real world. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the professions that you had, they were the same, right? You could count on it that for a long time to be existing. Most of the universities are, are teaching outdated techniques and methods. What they are teaching students, it's not, it isn't usually up to date. As far as I know, things might have changed. Let me put that clause. But um, so I won't put responsibility on the universities. The, respons the, the, the universities should, in reality, partner with the public sector. They should have their pulse on what's going on in the real world and make sure that what they're teaching the students would prepare them to function in that real world. But what's happening now is that students leave school and they are equipped to compete and function in a world that no longer exists. So a lot of them have to upscale, they have to rescale. And so I'll just go to the students. This is, this is where I think the hope lies as far as the profession is concerned. The world has changed in a way that ensures that now everything is on demand. We pull in what we want. So Netflix, you're not sitting down waiting for what the TV is going to serve you. You choose the, mo the movie you want to watch, the food you want to eat, you order it, it comes to you. Everything comes to you now. You order online, it comes to you. Education has become the same thing. If you look at the universities, there are the foreign ones who we look up to, they are scrambling around to compete with the new, um, the new way of life. So the opportunity for students is that they can go online and learn. It's very easy. Sometimes it's free. I know other than MIT, they have this EDX where you can actually get some free courses in architecture. I've taken one or two of them. And there are some you can pay for. You can even get um, certificates from those platforms. So the student has to be hungry. You must understand that there are bubbles in universities that um, he has to puncture before he leaves if he wants to have a head start. And with the use of software, with the use of the internet, he can pull in the relevant information. You can listen to podcasts. There, you can listen to podcasts on the business of architecture, the direction of technology, you know, in the built space. Just keep up to date and learn. It's very easy compared to my time when we have to go to the library and use cards before we could get books that were written in 1970 something, you know? Uh, so I would say the responsibility lies with the students. Now, I'll, I'll place my bet on the students being the ones to upgrade themselves in addition to what they learn and understanding that what they learn from school would just be about 20 to 40 percent of what they actually need to be successful. Okay, yes, that's, that's quite insightful because the world is rapidly evolving and the students need to be very, very adaptive to be able to compete in the real world, especially when the students have aspirations of competing on a global scale. So if you intend to compete on a global scale, you should be able to add more skills to yourself beyond 
the level use traditional training that you receive from the higher education institutions, which I believe in the near future should um, experience a whole lot of changes to be able to compete with the industry. So yeah, that's quite decisive. So I'll go to the next question. So when you look at Nigeria, most big projects that you have, especially in the architectural industry or the architectural practices, a lot of times you see that these practices, they offer consulting services using a very traditional contract method, which is the design build build. So from a business standpoint, do you think that architectural practices should develop the capacities that are needed to take up more integrated delivery, which in this case will involve both consulting and contracting rules on projects? Okay, thank you. The obvious answer is yes, but you know that yes has some clauses. Um, uh, what I've discovered is that the goals of organizations vary and you can't you really can't push growth you can't push change down the throat of companies if they can't see the benefit to them what i've found out is companies that are seeking an advantage that have set a goal that requires them to grow would look for ways to improve um, existing practices and methods they will be the ones looking for it. Um, so in essence, the goals of the company is paramount. As far as, as far as far as the industry itself is not chasing that demand on architectural practices, look, it's not going to happen. You understand? It's not going to happen if there is no external pressure to adopt more efficient practices. Unless it comes from within the company. For instance, I know one or two companies that they've set their sights on serving the um, West African market and even the East African market. And because they made that decision, they've realized that they must bring something extra to the table. It's no longer a matter of political connection or that we have an existing relationship or um, this is what the um, client wants you know it's now when i go in here how do i compete how do i stand out so yes yes in a way it is it is the next step forward it's like saying do you should people continue using a volkswagen beetle car or should they upgrade to a tesla the question will be the answer will be it depends on why you want to use it your um your goals if it's just to move from point a to b obviously the beetle is okay if you don't care about prestige and all of that however by the time you're adding i want efficiency i don't want to use fossil fuels i want to save the environment i just want to upgrade to the next next level then you would find a reason to say okay we need to upgrade to Tesla because the change process is not easy. It requires a lot of um, consultation, making sure there's buy-in. It's difficult. Some companies start and they stop. They fail in the implementation process. So in summary, I would say it is good that companies upgrade, but then more important than that, Companies need to know what their goals are, and then based on that goal, they can now decide um, how to adopt, what to adopt, and whether to adopt. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So basically, before you embark on a digital transformation journey or whatever destination you want to get, it's important to define you know, your KPIs, what exactly you're trying to achieve so that you don't go around scattering in different directions, which is completely true. So which now leads me to the last question. So basically this is the fifth question, uh, which is coming back to the business, talking about scalable businesses. So it's obvious that to create scalable business in today's world, it requires a high level of digitization and business automation. So how best do you think that architectural practices to equip themselves with the relevant digital skills to be able to you know, create these scalable businesses we've been talking about? Okay, thank you. 
Mm, I have an interesting question. So I'll say that uh, my my percep my perspective of scalable scalable businesses, you know, would focus on the fact that the the business can run without the founder working on it, working in it. Let me put it. That's one of the factors that you have enough systems, and that the more uh, load you get on it, the you know that the structure is robust enough to keep functioning even as the demand increases. So when you're thinking of how to digitize and build uh, business automation systems that will ensure that uh, the business has that capability. Traditionally, what would happen is that you get consultants to come in and look at your processes and design, you know, a solution for you. But nowadays, things have become very easy. There are so many different apps, applications. There are, there are, there are applications that help you with solving that particular um, problem. If you, if you decide, for instance, that what you want to automate is your accounting system, you can do that with apps, with the right um, bank grade security. If what you want to do is to um, automate your approval system, there are applications that can help you um, very, very well. If So I would say it's not as complex as, we, as it seems from the outside. A lot of people have already solved this problem. So just like Lego, you know, plug and play. But you must understand what you are doing. Um, you might still need to bring in external consultants to just help you, you know, but that apart. My grouse with Nigerian firms and the digitization and business automation process is that they don't seem to care. Uh, and when I say they don't seem to care, you 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 could you could go to a company and um, it's obvious they need training, but what you hear is, what if I train them and they leave? The rate at which my <laughs> staff members leave is very high. I lose, you know. So it's understanding that building a scalable business is such that whether knowing that people will come and people will go, but the system remains. So the system becomes the skeletal framework for on which you build your organization. You understand? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you think about it that way, you'll find that you're investing in the business and you can now say, okay, um, we're going to train our staff on a continuous basis. In fact, each staff member is going to have a, a learning path. They are weak in this area. Not everybody is the same. Uh, this person is weak in this area, strong in this area. So we're going to tailor a training uh, a plan that would help him serve the purposes of the company better. You know, that's, that's one of the things that should be done. If you're looking at one-year training plans, two-year training plans, continuous training should be one of these things, you know, and then understanding that you have to build systems. So businesses should, extra business should also look at um, getting consultants because think about the way you run a business. You're, you're designing, you're, you're on site, you're getting new clients, you're resolving issues. The time required to sit down and look at the business from outside, it will be very difficult because then your brain needs to be switching from, you know, working in the business to looking at the business from outside. The brain really isn't designed to do that. So you want people that spend all their time doing this kind of things to come in and guide. So if I'm to say this in summary, I would say the way you look at um, digitalization and business automation is important. If you see it as something that builds your, your business, that um, 
it doesn't rely so much on individual skills, but you know, it's it's the business pro it's the framework of how the business runs. Then more people will be able to um, go through the process, and then that as you build in this framework, you need to train the people that are going to run the business as well. So you are building up uh, documentation. Even if somebody new comes, there's something they can read that gets them up to speed without to run the system. You understand? If you can do all these yeah. things, I'm saying get external um, consultants to help you with it. Uh, it's it's better at the end of the day. So I hope I've answered you. Also, get apps. It makes life very easy. It's, Even a solo architect can use that. Yes, definitely. You've addressed quite some good part of the question. But of course, before I look at some of the comments, I know that for the past couple of years as well, you've also been working on some of this aspect of the business, you know, business automation. I don't know, perhaps you can shed more light on some solutions that you're working on or some that you might recommend for architects as well on automating or digitizing their businesses. Hmm. Okay. So, well, I can't go into too much details, but I can say that one of the things I'm working on is um specifically for architects to you know take an architect for instance if if you have the business the skeletal structure in place you can do a lot that is you know that um you are you, you your accounting is in place your um business registration is okay you have systems in place uh now instead of doing it one you do it for your business, you spend all the time, and then another business is doing that, you know, having an application that helps you to do that. If that is what I have seen as a solution that would even help the solo architects. So you just plug in and then you face building your business. So th this is one of the areas, but if you look at general apps, there's, um, I can't re remember now. There's an app built by someone in Ghana that helps you um, build your clients, helps you send them reminders automatically, helps you communicate with them. You know, these are some of the things that you need when you're running any kind of business anyway. So just by searching, you will find so many apps that would help you. I'm sure the lockdown helped a lot of people find out that you can actually have review sessions with your clients. You can you can use Calendly, for instance, <laughs> to book a time frame that gets, um, you know, so there are apps. Let me just put it that way. There are many apps you can use, um, already designed, and understanding that the African environment is a bit different has made me look at the direction of actually getting apps that factor in our environment. So I'll just keep it at like that. Um, okay, yeah. So obviously, if you, Google, if you Google on internet, depending on the use case and what exactly you're trying to digitize or automate about your business, there are obviously a whole lot of tools out there today that keep coming out on the daily. So at this point, I'll just look at some of the comments or questions. And also, if you have any question or comment based on our discussion we'll be having so far, you can also drop it into the comment section from wherever you're tuning in linkedin facebook or youtube so so far i can see about three comments here and this is from paul Adumani or something so he said this this discussion is very impactful mindset is the key i also said that the student must be hungry okay yeah so definitely then i have a comment here from christopher and so he said that we are beginning to see the encroachment of tech firms into the youth sector, taking up the challenge of product, product, productization. So an apparent example can be found in the multifamily residential markets. So what business advice will you give to architects regarding this? So should they step back or embrace the new business models uh, enabling source? Mm -hmm. You know, if you are if you are on this call, I would have asked you, what do you think? That's what I would have asked you first. Obviously, obviously the world is changing, and obviously architects are in a bubble. You know, I have 
about two or three books. Uh, I'm looking at one now, um, The Architect as Entrepreneur, and then there's another one, Architect as Developer. Even outside Africa, they are discovering that there are so many other approaches that we can take to um, running, practicing. Did they bring our services to the public? If I were an existing architectural firm, what I would do is set up a small unit to look into, like you've, like the example you've given here now, uh, multi-family residential buildings. That's something you can do, even if you don't want to transform the entire company to start doing that. It's so easy. It's so easy to do that kind of stuff. You understand? Um, how many architects do you know that have taken a course in AI, for instance? Because we are looking at it from outside. This thing is so complex. Uh, am I going to have to go back to school, learn new things? But if you take four months, five months out of the next 20, 30 years that you need, uh, that you're going to spend in the industry to acquire these new skills, it gives you a new pair of eyes, a different perspective from which to look at the the problems in the industry. And then, even if you're not the one building the solutions, at least you're able to speak with uh, people in the tech space and be the author of those changes. A few days ago, an architect, I saw the video of an architect who had designed a plugin that enables you to automatically develop floor plans. You just put in parameters and then it's, it adds the furniture itself. It's changing as you're changing. You know, that's an architect looking at what's happening, putting in AI and developing uh, a product, this time, for architects. So if you look at it from that perspective, we it's not nobody is holding a gun to our heads and saying, don't go into this industry. The it's open. It just has to be the willingness to do the same. Uh, I, I won't expect um, my generation upwards to really, really have the enthusiasm to go into that space. But the new generation there's nothing stopping you from doing this. Nothing. Yeah, I obviously agree. I completely agree with that because we also look at the view sector. You see that at the moment, we are just beating around the same end, end products from different angles. You have different, different disciplines, architects, engineers, and so many other quantity surveyors and the likes. And we are all working kind of in silos. At the end of the day, we are all working towards delivering the same product, but if you have this like a unified entity and you actually view it as a product that you are delivering, I believe that that will also begin to minimize the waste and the inefficiencies that we also have in our industry. Okay, so um, I can't see another question at this point. I don't know if any other person have any question. Okay, so. Maybe I should put the question to you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. But how do you think um, practices can equip themselves with the digital skills from your perspective? Okay. Yeah, of course. When you when you were answering the question, or when you the question I asked about, you know, creating international businesses, it all begins with the mindset you have when you are setting up the business. If you are creating a business that you believe that is supposed to last for several years, maybe 100, 200 years down the line, then that upskilling has to go a long way into the systems you are putting in place. So basically, even the, the onboarding process that you give to your staffs and the, the training athletes, for example, when I worked in a company, we had access to, for example, that, that was a home automation company, and the company already was a member of two different organizations that are in the systems integration industry. And as a staff, I had access to limitless learning materials from those from both organizations. So in the course of that, I even got some certifications and all that. So if companies are doing all that and they they are able to equip themselves knowing that they are, they are creating a system that's irrespective of 
who comes in and who goes out that system they've created will be able to keep the company going so i think it goes a long way into the systems you are building and also the resources you are putting in place for your staff because at the end of the day when you have better employees it obviously impact on the businesses the business you are creating so even if that employee leaves tomorrow the employee will always be kind of proud that he actually works in your company and also have, will have good things to say about your company and whoever comes in as well can easily take up from whatever that person left off so i think it's two things the systems you take time to create and also the resources you put in place for your employees because if you don't train those staffs and they actually stay in your company for a very long period of time it will also impact negatively on your company so okay. that's basically yeah so that is what i'm actually looking at and of There's course yeah okay you know i was going to just chip in that what i found out is that generally in life not just in the practice of architecture you're either going forward or you're going backwards there's no standing still so if you're not learning if you think okay i know it all let me stay with it you find that so many new things have happened that you are now <laughs> you're now behind maybe 30 years behind 20 years behind uh and so on that's what i was going to chip in yes that, that's true that's, that's definitely true Okay, I think before I round up, I'll just ask some of these random questions that I normally like to ask. So the first random question I have for you is, what's your favorite travel destination? I know you've traveled to different parts of the world. So what's your favorite travel destination so far? Or even the one you have in mind traveling to? Mm, so far, Sao Tome and Principe. I hope I pronounce this right. That's <laughs> been my favorite so far. It's it's like the Garden of Eden, right? <laughs> so green, the the colors so vivid, you know, the people so calm. Like I slept, I, I don't know. It was like I had been asleep before, and then I I slept in that place and woke up, and it was just fantastic. <laughs> My favorite so far, and I'm so glad that it's it's in Africa, you know. Um, they seen the historical relevance. That was where Einstein's theory of relativity was proved, you know. Uh, so, oh. yeah, so, so I, I, I really love the place. I would like to go back, you know, spend like two weeks or a, a month there, just reboot. Mm. Wow, that's great. Uh, I look forward to traveling there someday as well. Yeah, you should. Sure okay. Would. Yeah, so I have another question here. So what's your favorite pastime? I mean, outside of architecture and business development, what else do you also spend? Or do I, even at the introduction, I already mentioned some of them. But yeah, you can also shed more light on them as well. Okay, so I, I love riding motorcycle, <laughs> motorcy motorcycling. I love motorcycling. It's exciting. It, um, it, it helps. It's, in the biking industry, we call it um, therapy. And that's because when you're riding the bike, you can't be thinking about other things. You, are, you stay in the moment. So it's really refreshing. Um, then I love reading books. In fact, if, if I could get paid for reading books, I'll, I'll take the job. You get it. <laughs> yeah, because oh. yeah, you, can, you, can, you can get somebody's 30, 40 years experience. And in one week, you get all the major points. Even if it's fiction, you are still living, sometimes you are living several generations through the pages of the book. And apart from that, I love art, going to, going to exhibitions, um, viewing artworks, um, stage plays, just being around creative people. I love, I love those things. So those are, those are the things I do. I, of course, traveling as well and camping out in nature those are things i love doing yeah and obviously as architects those those activities also for creativity you know into our design and design thinking as, as architects and as creatives generally okay so at this point i can't see any other question or comment so thank you very much for making our time to share your experience and your you know, share some insight with us as regards business development and you know, architectural practices. 
which I believe can be applied anywhere, not just in Nigeria, but of course, I have to use Nigeria as a case study. So thank you very much. I also look forward to having you in a, in a future episode. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure being on the program. Yeah, you're most welcome. And thanks right. to everyone that also joined. I know that some people are busy watching football. Maybe that's why people are not able to make it to this ball. <laughs> Uh, can always you can always rewatch this, and if you also missed the previous episode, you can also check it out on blazeme.com, which I, I think I'll drop the link on the comment section as well. And um, thank you all for joining the session. We hope to see you in the next two weeks. So every two weeks we do this, we always reach out to a thought leader to share his experience with us in the industry. So thank you very much. All right. Bye. Yeah. Goodbye. I'm <laughs> not